Good evening and welcome to the weekend edition. My name is Peter Reznicek from ShadowTrader.net. Two big events are in the rearview mirror now. The first, of course, being the FOMC announcement on Wednesday. And then we had a quarterly options expiry today. So all of that left some interesting marks on the charts. We definitely have a lot to talk about as far as what's really going on. Beyond that, we're going to dip into the mailbag. I've got a sector watch for you. We're also going to talk about market profile and a number one draft pick. So plenty on deck for today's show. Without further ado, let's get into it. As I was alluding to in the intro, kind of a head scratcher of a week, right? We were expecting a little bit more volatility on the FOMC move. We did get the 50 basis point cut, which would normally signal that the Fed is a little bit scared, perhaps, of what's going on in uh, unemployment data, et cetera, or potential recession, but the market did not really respond that way. A little bit of negativity on Wednesday, but the real story happened after Wednesday in the overnight session between Wednesday and Thursday, when futures rallied incredibly, taking out all the weakness that they had over the FOMC move. So to that end, I wanted to start this segment today on a futures chart, not on the normal S&P daily. I want to move over here for a second, and we're going to start, as I was saying, on ES hourly, which is something that we don't normally show here, but really this particular time frame is the most important one that's going to give us some illumination, if you will, or a look inside of what was going on Fed and post-Fed. So again, hourly chart, this is ES. This right here is late Wednesday afternoon. This is your Fed action, which typically doesn't go anywhere. However, I'll be the first one to admit, I thought we were gonna have a little bit more fireworks on this move since it was the first cut in a while. This was the first time that the FOMC actually changed policy in some time, but you can see it was relatively muted with a relatively weak close. And here's where things get interesting. After that, the Thursday after, uh, afternoon evening session, or I should say Wednesday afternoon into Thursday morning, I apologize, was this, and it gave us this huge move up. Now we're gonna talk about this a little bit more as the show progresses when I get into the market profile portion of the show. I'm gonna show you how there are some nuances here that would lead me to believe this is nothing more than short covering at this point. And this is also a very, very important takeaway from this because it is not the type of buying that is really sustainable. You have to understand that when the FOMC move happened, closing down here put a lot of people short. And I believe that there was a lot of people short there in multiple time frames because they were thinking, oh, this 50 basis point cut is bearish, and they closed the market at the low then. And I think there was a lot of shock and awe to the next day on Thursday as this was uh, ramping up overnight. This type of a ramp up overnight, especially when you have a weak close like that, that is generally short covering. I would say even more than generally, it's pretty much known to be all short covering. You're not going to get new money buyers in the market in an overnight session. That's just not how it works. The new money buyers that are stickier are going to be more active in the RTH session, especially because they're more buying big blocks of equity as opposed to just futures. So these futures rallied hard on Thursday night. And in my opinion, whatever activity we saw after that in the Thursday RTH session as the market kept going higher was more of the short covering variety. And when I get into that market profile section, you'll start to see this. And then of course, Friday, coming here overnight was about flat and Friday you had this kind of big choppy action. This is actually normal, however, and I can't really glean too much information from it because you have to look at Friday through the lens of the fact that it was an options expiry, a monthly, but also a quarterly, which is really, really important. And this is typical type of action that you get on a quarterly OPEX where you get a lot of choppy action. Prices are getting pushed towards strike prices, a little bit of manipulation going on by larger players and not a lot happened. So regardless of how bullish you may think that this closed on Friday, I would say you want to take that a little bit with a grain of salt. And I'm thinking that some bigger fireworks in this market in either direction could happen next week. Now, before I get off of this futures chart, I want to just point out some key levels that I think are going to be very, very important next week. The market should stay bullish unless the FOMC area is taken out. So just remember that, that on the ES, you want to really be focusing on these levels here, which is about where we closed on the FOMC day. So keep it about 5680. If you want to look at 5700, which is a big round number, not that much higher than it, that would also be helpful as well. So remember, 5,700 down to about 5,680 in that area. In the futures, again, remember, we're not talking about the cash market, but in the futures, this will be important because that would then negate all of this short covering action, which is possible. Remember that these individuals here are weaker hands individuals. They are not uh, new money buyers. We always think in terms of old business versus new business. This is an important concept in market profile and in the futures market in general. 
old business gets transacted before new business, right? And this is very important. Old business is, of course, the covering of a position or the unwinding of a position. Old business is when somebody enters the market already having a position, and for whatever reason, they reverse that position. New business is when individuals or institutions come into the market cold, they have no position, and they enter a position, meaning they build a long position or they build a short position. So we have a lot of old business here. Old business is easy to retrace, but if it doesn't get retraced, then the market stays bullish. We just have to assume that's going to stay higher. And this is actually a really good reference point for lots of swing traders. I know there's many people in the audience that trade that two to five day time frame, which is very popular. As long as the ES can hold above that 5700, 5680-ish area, then assume that it's okay to the upside. If we lose that area, I do think there's some potential for a little bit more pulling in of the market and some weakness next week. Now that we've looked at the futures market, I just want to shift over to the cash market for a moment here, which is very, very important as well, obviously. I've left this all-time high level here on the charts. We talked about it last week. I was saying that if we move above the all-time high and then come back into range, that may be bearish. I do want folks to keep that in mind. This is really the key level next week. It's similar to that futures level we just talked about, but in the cash, you're looking at about 5670. Uh, and again, that's your all-time high. So just keep that in mind, all right? If you come back into range, could be a little bit more bearish, and then you could have some activity to the uptrend line. Obviously, if a bigger down move is gonna happen in the market, it's going to get active here below the trend. Until you lose trend, technically the markets are still bullish. But again, that all-time high area for us to hold it, I believe, is very, very important. And even more so because I believe that people that are active here in late stages of the rally, especially because they were active like on the Fed, short covering, et cetera, I do think that these are weaker handed players. And remember, weaker handed players need to get paid every single day. They want their profits in a shorter, faster manner. And if they're not getting them, they will liquidate those positions. And if so, you might see that move back into range below the uh, all time high. On to the market profile, one of my favorite topics to discuss on the show. A little bit on the esoteric side, but so valuable once you learn these concepts. I can't stress it enough. I write a newsletter about this every single morning with a short video telling you how I feel about the markets that day. Link is right there in the Chiron. I highly recommend you check it out. This sort of thing is really going to take your trading to another level. It is very, very nuanced. It does take some time to learn about, but once you do, you'll start to realize that the added element of time as opposed to just price and volume, it gives you so much more market generated information than you could ever imagine. Let's move over to the chart here on the market profile chart. First thing you'll notice is that I have changed the background colors uh, a little bit here to make it a little bit easier to see in these videos. Uh, please hit me up in the comments down below. Tell me if this is helpful or not, these colors as opposed to the white background, which I think was a little bit washed out. But what I wanted to focus here on in the profile is the ES around the Fed and more importantly that Thursday or I should say Wednesday evening into Thursday morning ramp up overnight and then how the profile distributions were looking on Thursday and Friday as well. So if you go back to Wednesday here, this is your Fed day here and this is RTH is here. So for those of you that are new to this, these are profile distributions of the ES futures. You can basically put profile on anything. You can put it on stocks. You can put it on futures, whatever you like. This is on the ES, which is the E-minis of the S&P, and is telling us basically not only what price and volume was doing, but also the element of time. So these distributions are kind of moving from left to right, and they're telling us how much time was spent at each price level, which is something that you absolutely cannot see inside of a candlestick or OHLC chart. So looking at this Wednesday, which was the Fed day, not too much to report on the Fed day, kind of decent sized value area, and value was relatively unchanged. Remember, value is really what matters in the markets as opposed to price. Value is so much more important, and the way we look at it here on the market profile is that the value area is simply where approximately 70% of the day's volume or time spent, but I use volume on these charts, happened. And that's very, very important because as you know, one standard deviation on either side basically of the mean, if you add those up, you get close to 70%. So you can see that the value was really unchanged on Wednesday, kind of similar to the value area on Tuesday. Tells you that when all was said and done for all the bluster and back and forth trading and all the algos hitting it, not a lot happened on Wednesday. But as I was saying, the real fireworks happened then on the Wednesday evening to Thursday morning overnight activity, which you can see here, that is this profile here, the more skinny one here. Here's your close on Wednesday. And all this activity here here, and it goes up off the screen, you can't even see it, that's that Wednesday night stuff. Now remember, this overnight activity 
is definitely weak-handed, short covering people. Okay, this is not longer term players. They're not active like that. This is short covering. And that's why this type of action often has higher odds of being retraced. And what happened is after that activity, that then took us into, let me just bring this down a little bit, that then took us into Thursday. And what I was noting on Thursday, which was interesting, was that this area right here in the middle of the chart, that's the point of control. And generally, if the market was more bullish, as it was as we had breached a new all-time high and we were in virgin territory, I'm curious as to why that point of control didn't migrate higher. The point of control is simply that level where the most amount of volume traded in any session. And in a more bullish tape, that point of control should migrate higher and close higher in the session. But on Thursday, we actually saw it close in the middle of the session, even though the high was all the way up here. These are very nuanced data points, but they tend to build on each other. So it's important to enter them into your narrative day by day as you go. So that was essentially Thursday. Then we had kind of a very squat overnight profile, which was pretty balanced. Um, about 100% net short as it was all kind of below the settlement, but I say balanced because kind of a very symmetrical profile, didn't really go anywhere, kind of inside. And then notice that on Friday, we actually made a much lower high and the same exact phenomena happened on Friday, which was the lack of migration higher of the point of control. You can see that little green section there. That's where the most volume traded in the session. Price actually closed higher here, but that volume didn't really follow. So again, kind of back to back, lack of POC migration, just some nuances to consider that's important. And last but not least, I'll just say the Friday activity here, I think for a person who's newer to the profile, they may say yes, but that Friday activity actually looks pretty good, right? Meaning that the profile is not stretched out. There's not a lot of emotion. People were supporting the bid, etc. This is true. However, I take this with a grain of salt because it was that quarterly OPEX and that's always going to be a lot of two-sided action. And that two-sided action is going to create that sort of, you know, traditional you know, good structure, so to speak, which is how it should look, but it's not really indicative of longer term buyers sitting on the bid and supporting it, waiting for those prices to come in, buy on the bid, let it rally, move your bid up, buy on the bid, let it rally. That's the type of price action that creates the good structure and also makes those points of control move higher because that volume is coming in to support the move. Remember, as always, if you want to learn more about the market profile and how it can help you in your trading, hit the Chiron down below, shadowtrader.net forward slash PPP. That's the link to the daily report that I write every day. It comes to you via email at 9 a.m. Eastern, so 30 minutes before the market opens. Plenty of time to digest. I always put this out as inexpensively as possible. It's $20 a month. You can also take a five-day free trial at that link that you see down below. If there's one takeaway from this video, I just want it to be this. It is simply that the market is still bullish. I'm just trying to point out that there are some chinks in the armor and it is kind of seasonality to it, which I'm not a big seasonality person, but if we are to see something adverse to the downside, I would think it would happen in September or October and it would probably also happen after the Fed just cut rates by 50 basis points. Does this mean that it has to happen? Absolutely not. We may be in for the greatest soft landing of all time. I don't know. We could just go sideways up into the rest of the year and that would be just fine. And when the market confirms to me that that's what it's doing, I, you can be sure that I'll be getting long, right? But for the time being, I think it's a little bit nebulous at best. So let's move over here. Generally in the sector spotlight, I show you just one sector. We focus on that. We look at the chart pattern, bullish or bearish, and maybe some potential opportunities within that sector. For this week's show, I thought I would focus on all 11 sectors here, which are all the 11 sectors that make up the S&P. Obviously, they are by weight, so kind of going in a clockwise fashion, heavier weighted sectors up in the upper left, that being, of course, technology, financials, healthcare, et cetera, lower weight sectors such as materials, energy, utilities over here in the bottom right. So starting from the top there, what I really want everybody to take away from this is the simple fact that these charts still look pretty good. I'll be the first to admit, I don't see anything really bearish going on here in the sectors, right? You got technology up here, looks pretty much okay, right? This is healthcare, kind of just going sideways, a little bit weaker than I think it could be. Uh, consumer discretionary looks fantastic here, actually moving up. Financials look fine, right? Two kind of small bullish bars there. Communications looks just fine. Uh, industrials here, just fine. And on and on, right? You get over here to 
consumer staples. Energy just rallied off these lows. Not a big mover in the S&P, but obviously just staged a big rally. Utilities look fantastic. This is probably not as bullish. I've been talking utilities for a while, saying that this chart has been bullish. It still looks great. Just keep that in mind. That's not a bullish sign, obviously, when the best performing chart here out of the 11 is actually utilities. And then you have materials and real estate here as well. So again, main takeaway from here, 11 sectors are very, very important. Watch these if you can. I always tell people that it would probably behoove you to have a window on your desktop and have all 11 of them at the same time in the order of the weight so that you can see how the 11 sector is moving because remember the S&P 500, which is the market as a whole, is not going to do anything different than what's happening right here in the 11 sectors. Time now for our number one draft pick. This is the part of the program where I leave you with one actionable idea for next week. And this week's idea is Carvana, which is actually quite a bullish chart, but this is actually a short setup. And I'm gonna show you why in a moment. Let's go over to the chart here. This is Carvana on a daily chart. And the first thing I want you to notice is obviously the overextension here from the eight and the 21. These are two moving averages. So I feel like the stock does have some potential for give back. But beyond that, there is this channel here that is in play. Remember a channel is simply when you collect, connect the tops of a move going like that. And we have now broken out to the upside of the channel. Generally, this is unsustainable price action whenever you move to the outside of a channel. So I'm putting that together with the overextension from the eight and 21 EMAs. And I do think it is a short, however, not the type of short where I would put on some debit on the put side, more of the type of short where you would sell some calls on the call side and collect some credit. As you know, I'm a huge fan of the Broken Wing Butterfly. I think it is the number one options trade that every trader should have in their arsenal. So to that uh, end, you can see here that I am actually in a BWB situation right now uh, in Carvana where I'm short a whole bunch of uh, calls here at the 190 level, but I'm also long 187.50. So my structure is a long 187.50, short two times at 190. And then you can see here, I've got some two tens just to cover it. And this structure brings in a credit. This is about a 30 cent credit today. Obviously, had I just sold more of the mid strike naked, that would be a bigger credit. And I did do a little bit of that. As you can see the structure, it's like 10 by 35 by 10. But here's the thing, if I'm wrong, remember, I've got a 187.50 call in hand hand and there's a lot of different things I can do with it. Let's say the stock rallies like crazy, moves towards my short strikes. What I'm probably going to do is simply take those short 190s, flip them, roll them up and out to 200, 205 or whatever in the next week's expiry and still be sitting on those 187.50s longs that I can sell. All right. So that's the beauty of the broken wing butterfly structure in that it can be bullish and bearish or neutral at the same time. You can be collecting credit or going directional. A lot of different ways to play it. But regardless, I think car Carvana is in for a little bit of a pullback next week from these levels. Time now to dip into the mailbag. As I always tell you, I get lots of emails each week from subscribers and just traders out there on the internet looking for some advice or trying to run some ideas by me. This one I thought was really interesting came in uh, today uh, from a subscriber and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically this person uh, was giving a whole litany of problems that they may be having trading, but I just wanted to focus on a couple of points here that I've circled here where this gentleman said, there are too many setups, so I take them all. Examples include VWAP bounce, then breaks and get stopped, 821 pinch only to have it reverse. I've even added confirmation with ticks and weighted AD. All of that, by the way, is correct. This is obviously a futures trader who's having some issues. These are the things that you should be looking at. But here's where it gets interesting. The individual writes, there are too many levels to play. By the time I start trading, I have a good six to seven levels per day, and it seems like I play them at any given point. So my advice here is simply that if you cannot yet master and be consistent with just one setup, it would probably behoove you to not be looking at multiple setups. So I would say to this trader here, try to pare it down to just one setup, get very good at that one setup and just stay with it. And also understand that if you're getting six to seven to eight to 10 different signals a day, that's way too many signals. You're simply not gonna be able to follow all that 
And you have to understand, and as the person alluded to here in the email saying that they enter on the signal only to have it reverse, that immediately tells me that this individual is not paying enough attention to context. They're just thinking that each signal is equal to another signal and that's not true. Whatever your edge is in the market, remember that it is going to generate more signals than are actually valid. Your job as a trader is to parse those signals and to figure out which ones are valid and which ones are not. And of course you don't know when entering a trade if it is going to become a winner or a loser, but using all those contextual clues of the breadth, the AD, weighted AD, what are the ticks doing, what is the general tone of the market, etc. all of that is gonna help you to discern whether or not that setup is legit. And as you move further and further along in your trading journey, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to make those discernments quicker and quicker and quicker and be able to know on a moment's notice, getting the signal, checking the context, saying, yes, this is a legit setup. And then most importantly, entering it without having another thought, without any sort of doubt or hesitation or anything. You've done it so many times that it just becomes second nature. So that's basically the goal of where you want to get to with the understanding that even when you move to that level, there's no such thing as mastery. Nobody can say that they've mastered trading. There's no such thing. I've been in this game a long time and I consistently also have losing trades. I see trades where I could have done this better, I could have done that better, et cetera. Do not come into this game thinking that you are ever going to eradicate all of that. The best you can do as a trader is to minimize those losses, use some of the strategies like I talk about here all the time in my options advisory, brokering butterfly, things like that. These are strategies that by nature minimize losses even when you're dead wrong. And most importantly, always be paying attention to context. That's the most important takeaway here. Again, I get lots of emails like this week after week, and when I see that the person tells me I take all these different setups but it doesn't work, I think they might just be taking too many setups. So focus on mastering just one and pay very close attention to context. And that's my show for today. Thank you so much, as always, for spending a little bit of your weekend with me. Let's recap some of the important points that were discussed in this particular program. It's still bullish out there, but I'm kind of not believing it. And worst case scenario for me is that I miss out on a few long trades. And you know what? I'm fine with that because I would much rather be in that position than to be piling on long here and have all that fall apart in my face over the next few days. Remember that sometimes these reactions to what is happening in the FOMC can be somewhat muted at first and then can catch traction later. And I think that may be the case of this week only because we ended the week on a quarterly options expiration and generally the week into any expiration, or especially I should say those monthly expirations, they're generally bullish and you're not gonna see a big move on that particular Friday as those prices are getting pushed around uh, strikes. As next week develops, remember to keep your focus on those two key areas that I talked about, both in the ES futures market and also in the cash market. In the cash market, it's really simple to see. It's just that all-time high level. We've now traded two sessions above it, and I do feel that short-term traders which are in control of this market, especially in such a late stage of this rally, I feel like they need to get paid, they need to hold the market above that level, and anything below it could bring in a little bit of selling, so watch out for that, all right? In closing, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and also that bell to be notified when Shadow Trader posts new content. And as always, coming at you from beautiful Los Angeles, California, I wish you good trading and good night.